It's one of those ironies that one of the most common questions we get at the Heart Mountain Interpretive Center has nothing to do with the Japanese American experience. About once a week at least, a visitor will look at us and ask, why do they call that thing Heart Mountain? Which is a reasonable question. Heart Mountain is an iconic and distinctive landmark but it's not exactly something you'd expect to see on a Valentine's Day card. So, come join me today as we take a closer look at the mountain that gave its name to the Japanese American confinement camp in Wyoming. First, some basics. Heart Mountain is a lone mountain located in the northwestern corner of the Bighorn Basin of northwest Wyoming. It's about an hour out from the east gate of Yellowstone. It stands a little over 2,000 feet above the basin floor. It also has a very distinctive shape. Heart Mountain looks roughly like a half dome with a smaller spire west of the dome. Many of people have described the shape of the mountain seen from the north or south as a face seen in profile. Seen from the east or west, however, it looks like a single flat-topped mountain, almost like Devil's Tower. This distinctive shape means that the mountain looks slightly different from every angle, and people living in the region often associate a particular view of the mountain, seen from home, as theirs. And this includes the Japanese Americans at the Heart Mountain Camp from World War II. Now, Heart Mountain is technically a cleep. This means that geologists think it was once part of a branch of the Absorca Mountains extending into the Bighorn Basin. But erosion has worn away most of that extension, leaving Heart Mountain standing alone. The other thing to know about Heart Mountain's geology is that it is weird. Really, really weird. That's not supposed to be possible weird. This mountain has had geologists scratching their heads for decades because the summit of the mountain is actually 300 million years older than the ground that it sits on. Now, this goes against the most basic rule of geology. So as a rule of thumb, geology relies on something called stratigraphy. The lower a layer of rock is, the older it is. If you think of it like a layer cake, it can sort of make more sense. If you think about it, you can't put the top layer of the cake in place and then slip the bottom layers in underneath it. You always have to build from the bottom to the top. Even mountains obey this rule. Sometimes an earthquake or shifting in the ground will distort the layers, turning them on their side or folding them. But even then, you can still see the layering of how it got there. But not Hard Mountain. Heart Mountain is a giant chunk of limestone and dolomite from the Ordovician through the Mississippian eras, sitting on top of the Willwood Formation. So this is a chunk of stone that's 500 to 350 million years old, sitting on top of stone that is only 55 million years old. And there are no layers in between either. One or two missing, sure, we can explain that, but three million years worth it's like the peak of Heart Mountain just sort of fell out of the mountains to go plunk in the middle of the Bighorn Basin. Well, <clears throat> in fact, a lot of geologists think that's exactly what happened. You see, the primary theory about the origin of Heart Mountain today is something that geologists call the Heart Mountain Detachment. Remember, Hard Mountain is close to Yellowstone. This is a very geologically active area, and by that, I mean volcanoes. Basically, the theory goes that around about 49 million years ago, a volcano somewhere near Cook City in Montana triggered a massive rock slide. The biggest rock slide that we have evidence for on the face of the earth, except for one that is under the ocean. So this rock slide tumbled its way through the Absorca Mountains and quite possibly was actually skidding on a cushion made of vaporized rock, which is quite the mental image. And it traveled about 30 miles. Heart Mountain was one of the last rocks to tumble to a stop. 
It's not the only one, though. There are traces of this rock slide all throughout the Absorca Mountains. Now, one thing that geologists aren't clear on is how fast all of this happened. Some people argue that a movement like that must have taken years. Others have pointed out that rock slides tend to happen very fast and that, generally speaking, if a rock stops, it's not inclined to start again. So this whole rock slide could have happened in as little as half an hour. To which I have to say, as impressive as the thought of an entire mountain moving at a mile a minute would be really glad I wasn't actually there to see it myself. Ever since its dramatic arrival in the Bighorn Basin, Hard Mountain has been a key landmark for local peoples. We know that the Bighorn Basin has been inhabited since what archaeologists call the Paleo-Indian times, 12 to 10,000 years ago. The lower slopes of Hart Mountain have many stone circles that were left behind by teepees from the period when iron nails weren't available to pin the edges of the teepees down and they had to use rocks. The people incarcerated in the Hart Mountain camp have often gone hunting for stone arrowheads. Most of the native lore about the mountain that we know today comes from the Apsalika most commonly known as the crow, and I really hope that I'm not butchering the pronunciation. So far as we can tell, the Apsalika have lived in this region since at least the 1400s, and Hart Mountain was both an important navigational landmark and a place of spiritual power for them. It was the site of battles and of important spiritual journeys. To the Apsalika, Hart Mountain is known as Fortop's father, Fortop was a warrior who went to the mountain for a spirit quest. In a dream, the mountain told him that it was his father and would protect him for as long as it stood. Fortop went on to become a great leader until one day he died during a battle. When the Apsalika returned to Hart Mountain, they discovered that a massive rock slide had destroyed part of the mountain. Now, the current name of the mountain, which we are finally getting to, that probably comes from native accounts as well, but the story is a little blurrier. What we know is that when Lewis and Clark were returning from their famous expedition, one of their scouts, John Coulter, got permission to leave the expedition early in order to double back and explore what is now northwestern Wyoming. He came back with stories of bubbling mud pots and great geysers of water, which many people didn't believe. But Clark added the things that Coulter described to his map. And one of the things that was added is a solitary peak labeled Heart Mountain. Now, where exactly the name comes from is surprisingly vague. Generally, the explanation given is that while the mountain doesn't look like a Valentine's Day heart, the Valentine's Day heart is a European symbol, and it doesn't actually look very much like an organic heart at all. But there is a certain resemblance between the mountain and an organic heart, especially as seen from certain angles. The story I have always heard is that the mountain was Buffalo Heart Mountain originally, but I've heard versions where the mountain was compared to a human heart, or even that native peoples realized they had been dislocated from deep in the heart of the Absorca Mountains. Either way, the name has stuck. As an interesting twist, although the original name on the Lewis and Clark map is heart, like what's beating in your chest, around the time that European Americans began settling in the area that's now Cody, a lot of them thought that it was heart, as in a type of deer. Where that version of the name came from, no one seems to be really certain. One theory is that it came from the name of a major heart who was part of the campaign against the Nez Perce in 1877. It also might have been a simple spelling error originally. If you're spelling something based only on how it sounds, would you put an E in a heart? Anyways, since the mountain is written heart with an E on Lewis and Clark's maps, the first English language maps of the region, and the name corresponds with the names used by the original inhabitants of the area, that version has become the official name. 
but you can still see the H-A-R-T spelling at various businesses in the region. Now, originally, the area of the Bighorn Basin, which includes Hart Mountain, was granted to the Upsalika by the 1851 Treaty of Fort Laramie, also called the Treaty of Horse Creek, by the Upsalika, Cheyenne, Sioux, Arapaho, Assiniboine, Mandan, Hidatsa, and Arikara peoples who participated. The treaty was broken almost immediately by both fighting between the native peoples and by settlers. As you can probably imagine, if you are at all familiar with the history of the American West, matters became worse after gold was discovered in Colorado and the Black Hills. So there was a rush of Euro-American settlers who pushed the native peoples in those regions out and into the territory of other tribes, including the Upsalika of the Bighorn Basin. So while the Bighorn Basin lacked the gold deposits that had triggered the rushes in Colorado and South Dakota, the Homesteading Act of 1862 still led to a sharp increase in settlers in the region, including in areas that technically belonged to the local tribes. Now, northwestern Wyoming, including the Bighorn Basin, was settled relatively late. Settlement in these areas mostly got started with the founding of the town of Cody and the building of a dam on the Shoshone River and the Shoshone Irrigation Project of 1903. You see, the biggest obstacle to settlement in this region was the lack of water. The Bighorn Basin was, and still is, primarily sagebrush desert. Because of the very low annual rainfall, irrigation was essential to converting land over for agricultural use. However, digging the canals and ditches needed for irrigation was a massive labor-intensive project. William Cody, AKA the famous Buffalo Bill, and the people who helped him found the town of Cody, well, they quickly found out that they didn't have the funds to irrigate the whole region. As a result, the project was taken over by the Department of the Interior. The irrigation of the area around Hart Mountain itself began in 1937. Sulfur deposits and conflicts between construction companies did slow the work down, but by about 1941, the Civilian Conservation Corps was working on preparing the local canals that would make the area actually farmable. And then you get Pearl Harbor and World War II, and many of those workers left to join the army. This whole story of late settlement and irrigation that's actually key to why Hart Mountain was chosen as the location of one of the 10 confinement camps that were built to hold the 120,000 Japanese Americans forcibly removed from the West Coast in the wake of Pearl Harbor. The War Relocation Authority, or WRA, had a number of criteria for where the camps had to be located. Had to be near a railroad to facilitate transporting so many people, had to be a safe distance from any important facilities like power plants and factories. They wanted it to be close, but preferably not too close to a settlement. And it needed enough arable land that the camp would eventually be able to supply at least part of its food needs on its own. In addition, out on the West Coast, the Japanese American community had developed a reputation as excellent farmers skilled at developing marginal farmland into good farmland, mostly because discriminatory land practices meant that marginal lands were what they could get. Now, we talk about the agricultural program in another video, so I won't go into great detail here. Suffice to say, the Japanese Americans finished the canal work left by the CCC. The agricultural output of the Hart Mountain confinement camp was incredibly successful, to the point that they had to build two gigantic root cellars to store all of their crops. On the other hand, Hart Mountain itself meant more than that to the people of the camp that was named after it. For many of them, the mountain was really the first thing that they saw of their new involuntary home. Impressions of the mountain range from an ugly bit of rock that didn't look like a heart no matter how I looked at it, so that reaction, nothing new, to featuring in a famous haiku poem carved into a rock that was found at the site. One of the more interesting aspects of how the Japanese Americans at Heart Mountain approached the mountain is the degree to which they identified the camp and the mountain together. 
Now, some of that might simply be due to a quirk of language. In English, both the camp and the mountain were simply called Heart Mountain, which would naturally lead people to mentally conflate the two. As an interesting side note, this use of the same term, that didn't happen in Japanese language sources. Japanese speakers tended to refer to the camp just as senta, literally the center. References to the mountain were usually phrased as kokoro mine, or heart peak, translated into Japanese. But beyond these verbal aspects, how heart mountain often stood in visually for the camp itself. One of the most famous examples of this is the work of Jushiro Miyauchi, who painted dozens of camp scenes, which always had the mountain looming in the background. Again, we have a separate video that's specifically dedicated to his work, so if you're interested, feel free to check it out. Also, the camp newspaper, The Sentinel, its headpiece was a silhouette of the mountain, and in fact, they claimed that the name Sentinel was supposedly chosen as an indirect reference to the mountain itself. At other times, the mountain sometimes seems to stand in for the world beyond the camp, particularly in poetry. Now, this association could be because while the mountain was always visible to the west of the camp, it wasn't actually within the land given over to the camp, and therefore it was largely inaccessible to the Japanese Americans. It wasn't entirely inaccessible. We do know that a couple of times small groups were allowed to hike up the mountain. And we even know that a group of women traveled to the foot of the mountain at one point to collect wild mustard for flavoring homemade pickles. So it's not that the mountain was completely beyond reach, but trips to visit it were usually remarkable enough that they featured in the weekly news. In addition, in the years after the camp closed, the mountain has continued to have kind of a signature image in standing for the Heart Mountain Camp. One former incarceree commented, once you see that mountain, you know you can't be anywhere else. Estelle Ishigo reflected that the mountain became our secret. As the Japanese Americans returned to the West Coast, finally, for her, she always felt like the mountain was hovering just beyond the horizon. Still, the story of the mountain doesn't end with the departure of the Japanese Americans. For one thing, with the area around the mountain now irrigated, the Bureau of Reclamation opened it up for homesteading. Many of the homesteaders actually took souvenirs of the camp with them in the form of the barracks and other buildings from the camp. Those were available for sale. Now, these barracks became many things, which range from churches to veteran centers and lambing sheds, but most of them became houses, which are still in use today. And just as the mountain was an important landmark for the native peoples of the region and then the Japanese Americans, many of the homesteaders identified with their particular view of the mountain, and they even navigated by it. Even with the completed irrigation, however, farming in the region remained very difficult. Many of the small-scale homesteaders ended up moving away. Others would purchase those lands in order to expand their own operations. The land of the mountain itself ultimately came into the ownership of four separate ranches that used the mountain for grazing land. In fact, three of those ranches continue to graze their cattle there to this day. However, in 1999, the Nature Conservancy purchased a large part of the eastern slope of the mountain from the Fourth Ranch. You see, one of the Nature Conservancy's goals is preserving diverse ecosystems, and Heart Mountain supports some of the highest numbers of rare plants found on private property in the area, including Howard's Forget-Me-Nots, Shoshonia, and Absorca Golden. It also has many of the classic plants of the area, so Indian paintbrush, bitterroot, prickly pear, blazing stars. And on top of the plant life, the mountain often sees elks, bears, mountain lions, pronghorn and mule deer, and birds that range from eagles and nighthawks to long-billed curlews. In addition, the Nature Conservancy offers public access to the mountain for visitors, with a trail that starts at the foot of the mountain and winds its way up to the top of the main peak. 
The trail includes informational panels about the ecology and history of the mountain, and also helps to explain the local geography visible during the climb around the edges of the Bighorn Basin. This trail has been a boon for many people, not just nature enthusiasts. For one thing, Japanese Americans from the Heart Mountain Camp have returned to the area for private pilgrimages for many years, and such visits have frequently included climbing Heart Mountain itself. Bacon Sakatani, known as Mr. Heart Mountain to some, first hiked the mountain in 1984, and he arranged with the landowners to lead other hikes in the years before the Nature Conservancy came. He even delivered Estelle Ishigo's ashes there as per her final request as part of the Return to Heart Mountain event in 1999. So the mountain has remained part of the consciousness of the Japanese Americans. In addition, the Apsalika have also found their way back to the mountain after being forced to give up their claim and withdraw to the reservation in Montana. Grant Bulltail, an elder of the tribe, inherited many stories about the mountain. So, starting in 2012, he began leading tribal elders and youths up the mountain to conduct a pipe ceremony at the tree line. Sadly, Bulltail passed away in October 2020, but hopefully others will continue the tradition in his stead. So ultimately, Heart Mountain's story is one of both movement and permanence. The mountain itself is, in a way, a stranger from a distant land, something that doesn't quite belong where it ended up. But it's also been a marker of eternity for the many peoples who've passed through the region, even as the occasional rock slide, the changing perspectives, and even just daily shifts of weather and clouds reminds us that stone itself can change. Through it all, Heart Mountain really has been, in many ways, the heart of life in the Big Four Basin. Even if you still probably wouldn't put it on a Valentine's Day card. <laughs>